album, uh, Proven Worldwide, which uh, comes with this DVD, um, is, is basically, there's, there's no great grand scheme. I mean, what I do is, um, studio's the day job. It's nice to make records when you're a DJ and, and have tracks that are exclusive to you. Not only do you know you're the only person with a copy, but you can actually watch the reaction as it happens. You know, you can make something in the studio on a Friday night, burn it to CD, be playing it later that night, and if needs be, be making uh, major or minor tweaks to it first thing Monday morning when you're back in the studio. So what we what, what I've done over the course of the last sort of 18 months is just put together records that have worked for me really well in the clubs. Some things have uh, fallen by the wayside, and uh, and what we've done is gather together those tracks that really worked over the course of that 18 month period worked everywhere, whether I played them in, in Europe, in the US, whatever continent. Th those tracks that have really stood the test of time and have worked in all markets are the, the tracks we put together for the album. Well, the last thing we want to do is make this seem like MTV Cribs, where everything's like pristine and nobody actually ever does anything. And you go around kitchens and lounges that look like they've probably just rented the house for the day. I live here, normally speaking my, my little kids and my missus would be here, they're actually away for the day. My lifestyle's pretty unhealthy in many ways, late nights, kind of, probably a bit too much alcohol, so I do try and eat fairly healthily to compensate, as well as doing some exercise to keep the old belly down. Um, one of the things I do a lot is actually just make huge smoothies where you, where you blend up loads of bits of fruit. Uh, obviously, enough, I've been out last night and um, came in about four o'clock, went to bed about half four, and typically was up at nine o'clock this morning. So, this kind of cooking and eating healthily is my sort of attempt to give my extremely challenged body something back again. Uh, whether it makes any difference, I don't know. I, we will see. Um, you're actually here at a time when the festival season and a beef is upon us. Uh, Judgment Sunday's my beef club night starts in about three weeks' time. Um, tonight I'm doing a festival called Hi-Fi. Um, and I wouldn't say there's any necessarily any special preparation you do for a festival, but one thing you, you generally speaking, it has to be said, you probably play a little bit safer when you play in front of a huge crowd. I mean, I, I haven't been told exactly what size uh, auditorium I'm playing in, but I would imagine it's going to be in the sort of 5,000 plus capacity. It's generally speaking in the clubs where you where you kind of take chances, where you, you road test tracks, and it's in the festivals where you play those banker tracks that are not necessarily obvious or commercial, but the ones you know are going to work, and that's kind of what we're gearing up for tonight. Uh, what the connection between me and making a multi-berry smoothie in tonight's set is, I've got no idea, but um, hopefully you can enjoy these rather trivial aspects of my life. Let's go to the bin. Right, so a bit of banana. Uh, well, I got started with DJing via putting on parties in my local neighbourhood. It was kind of in the late 80s, which was full of kind of really bland R&B in the clubs and, and, and no dance music. So we catered for two latest demands. One, music, and two, the fact that people wanted to go out late. I mean, at the time, you could barely go out after two o'clock. And that's really when our parties kicked off. So that's kind of how it all kicked off for me. I mean, it sounds very simple, but there were, there were big up, ups and downs within that. You know, I got arrested a couple of times, although I never charged. Had some parties busted by the police, lost money as well as gained money in the, in the party promotion. It certainly wasn't one great big sort of rosy story. So the very fact now that I'm able to kind of be what's called a sort of professional DJ, although some would argue to the contrary, is for me quite an achievement because I never really aspired to be a DJ as my job. I always thought well, maybe, you know, I was, I was studying law, I didn't really want to be a lawyer but I thought I'd have to do that during the day to kind of uh, finance my, my, my real passion which was music at night and in my spare time. So I'm going to give this a quick zap. And now all you need is a cocktail umbrella. <laughs> In terms of the, the technology since I first started making records, I mean the, the key thing is how much cheaper it's become. Uh, in the past you needed to have a, a standalone unit to do a lot of the functions that can now be done, be done within, simply within your computer. You needed to have a sampler, you needed effects units, you needed outboard equipment, you needed keyboards, you needed m uh, music modules. All of which, if, if that's the way you choose to work, can now be done as plugins within the confines of your computer. If you spent 100 grand um, ten years ago, you could get a similar lineup of equipment for ten grand or even less now, uh, which which is good because it opens up the the world of music making making to people who previously wouldn't have been able to do it for a financial reason. 
I spend a hell of a lot of time in this sort of office space. I've got a computer here, um, a Mac G5. I've got a quite a small Mac laptop. Um, CDJ 1000s, vinyl turntables, which don't seem to get called upon much these days. Um, I guess I should, should talk a little bit about the CDJ 1000. I mean, this was reinventing the wheel as far as DJs were concerned. Um, they first started bringing out their, Pioneer started bringing out their, their CD range about 10 years ago, and I got given one of the early ones, and it was a big, cumbersome thing that just did nothing. It was very user unfriendly. There were so many things about vinyl that, that CD players couldn't do. For a start, you couldn't read. With vinyl, you can kind of look at the grooves and work out when the breakdowns were going to happen, which really made DJing quite easy because you could second guess what was about to happen. And also, um, the kind of scratching, the, 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 the way you can manipulate the, the intros to tracks just couldn't be done on early CD players. Then all of a sudden, what did Pioneer do? They brought out the CDJ 1000 three years, years ago. And I remember meeting Roger Sanchez in a, in a business lounge in Barcelona Airport, and he had one in a flight case, and he demonstrated it to me. Little did I know how much impact it would have, both on me personally, in terms of the way I did my job, and on DJs globally. Um, these things just are better at what they do. Um, make no mistake, they're no easier to mix on than vinyl, it's, it's the same ultimately, but you can just do so many more things. I mean, you can... I won't annoy you any longer, but that's... It, the, the list of things is pretty much endless. As far as the radio show's concerned, I've written out the script, they've already been sent through to my producer and the assistant producer over at Radio 1. Um, I've done the mixes on here. This is kind of a, a convenient setup where the monitor speakers are almost sat right in your ear, which makes mixing quite sort of comfortable. Everything's done. It's recorded onto, um, onto CD. I take that along to Radio 1, although on certain occasions I could send it through as a, as a file um, if we needed to do some prep in advance. I had my first studio probably 15 years ago, um, which was a rented studio I shared with, with uh, a school friend of mine called Rollo. Um, it's always been something I've done alongside um, DJing. The, the, the main difference is that in the, in the past sort of five, six or seven years, I do it alongside somebody who's sort of working on the tracks with me because it means that I uh, can, can, can actually go away and the tools aren't down, the, the tunes continue being worked on. Well, we've just arrived at Radio 1, uh, it's kind of geared up and ready for the show. I mean, a lot of the preparations have been done already, so I can afford to be relatively relaxed. But the fact the camera's in there may, be, may make me a little bit more nervous, so who knows, stage fright might set in. There's four studios, one's under construction, I come out of Studio 4. This is the live lounge, coming through here. Two studios there, one more. I have to go through this rather moody looking back alley, full of cables that appear to be going nowhere. And here we go. Studio 4 here at Radio 1. Uh, and this is quite a contrast from how I started. I mean, I started on Pirate Radio in some of the most dodgy council blocks, all in different parts of London. The studio was always being moved. Uh, the, the transmitter was like a microwave link away from the studio on the top of various hills. Uh, so to come from that, which really was quite dodgy, I mean, it would... Some DJs used to smoke weed during their shows, other DJs had sex during their shows. I mean, every cliche of pirate radio existed, which couldn't be more of a contrast to, to the relatively clean cut experience of what goes on here at Radio 1. Although superficially the, the, the job title DJ embraces both being a club DJ and being a radio DJ, there the similarity ends. I mean, on, on radio I'm, I'm being heard by a million people. In a club, at maximum, it's probably sort of a couple of thousand unless I'm doing the odd festival. Um, so it's almost like the analogy uh, of an actor who might love theatre work because he gets the cut, you, know, you can smell the audience and feel the audience, but the, uh, the TV and film work is kind of what gets you a much greater degree of acclaim and exposes you to a wider public. And, uh, and that's a fairly decent analogy. In order to demonstrate this, I know how I need to find out how to turn the fucking thing on. I'm not going to pretend that I know half of what goes on in here, which is why we have people called producers. But um, this is fun. This is this is my what we call the cart wall. It's touch sensitive, so if, if we're at a particularly poignant, banging moment of a record, you want to sort of add a bit of oomph. We go. Building your appetite for a Saturday night on Radio One. The problem is the tendency is to do it an awful lot, which pisses the listeners off. Uh, over here is, is pretty much a kind of conventional sort of DJ booth, as you find it in a club, certainly equipment-wise. Um, 
which comes up on one channel on the desk. So I've got my, my two CDJ 1000s, my turntables, my mixer, uh, another opportunity to kind of press, press jingles spontaneously. This party is now in session. It's Judge Jules on Radio 1. Hello, Rach. Hello, one. Uh, <laughs> how are you? Rest? Sorry, Rachel. I always do that all the time. It's a really bad joke day today, you? isn't it? I can't believe it. Jules is in there critiquing my style. I can't <laughs> believe it. Jules, get on the mic. Over that mic. Oh, right this one, this one, this one. You can do this with me, all right? Judge Jules, there you are, mate. Hello. What's your middle name? I haven't got one. Don't I? I genuinely haven't got You've one. You've got ridiculous first and second. I, I called Julius O'Reardon, that's seven syllables. Is that not enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Rachel. Bye. Everything should be pretty much set up now. It should be an air of calm before the madness hits. And um, yeah, all the, all the stuff is set up. Paul is usually talking to Trevor just to sort of like, you know, uh, sort of prep for the show. Can you say something a bit street for a change, Jules? <laughs> I've never heard him say anything. Yay! Fresh. <laughs> I want to be street if you covered me in tarmac. <laughs> That's at least pretty street, isn't it? <laughs> Our conversations are so. <laughs> that was good anyway. Yeah. Verbal sparring. Mate, Thank you very much. One minute with Dino. Get me. Hello and welcome. I feel I've been here somewhere before actually. Your chat, your communications is the lifeblood of this show. 08700 100 100 will be broadcasting the best of what you've got to say throughout the show. Or you can text if you fancy keeping it short form to 81199. Building your appetite for a Saturday night is what we're about here on Radio 1. Getting you in the mood for everybody's favourite night of the week. And I guess it's really difficult to kind of judge what your show's been like because the way it sounds to an audience and the way it is to you are two totally different things. I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're not sort of witnessing it in the environment in which it's listened to, but I'm happy. I hope other people are happy too. If you go out and buy a great record, you, you, you buy it because you, you appreciate its vibe and it just you know just grabs you by the by the scruff of the neck. Whereas when, with music making, you've, you've got to build it from, from the bottom upwards, from, from absolutely nothing, from, from white noise up to the point of being the completed article and, and sometimes that can take a long time. We've, we've plugged the details for the Hi-Fi Festival into the sat-nav, although we've actually been to this location on quite a few previous occasions because it used to be where, where homelands, the now deceased homelands, were, were, were staged. It's right in the middle of real um, NIMBY, not in my backyard, sort of true blue Daily Mail reading Britain. But at the same time, um, it's in a natural bowl. So very little of the sound actually goes out of the, of the area that it's in, which um, makes it quite unique in, in the whole of Britain, in fact, as, as a perfect location for a large festival. Well, when we get to festivals, you never quite know how quickly you're gonna be able to get to your arena. Most festivals have got kind of service roads that run around the whole outside so that you can get to all the tents via a sort of a, a secured perimeter area. Well, we've arrived here and we've managed to navigate ourselves to actually the pole parking position. That there is the, the backstage entrance. Here is our car. We've gone past every security so we can literally race straight in. It's always nice to know that your car, the refreshments contained within your car, all the amenities of your car are very close to the decks. Festivals will always attract a lot of media in the same way that media will go to Ibiza if they want to do some dance music stories. Um, you know if you've got all these DJs in one place it's killing a multitude of birds with one stone. So um, inevitably there's loads of kind of press stuff to do and uh, I try and answer to the best of my ability. <laughs> Ferry course is on before me and Fergie's on after me. So did you hear your shouts? <laughs>
we're going to jump in the car and uh, hopefully I'll snore really loudly. I'm really only interested in kind of two definitions, uh, one being good and bad and the other one being uh, a certain BPM, you know. If I play a slightly housier set, which I occasionally do, I'll be, I'll be playing roughly 130 BPM records. If I'm playing the more trancey stuff, it'll be roughly 140 40 BPM. But beyond that, I try not to get bogged down in specific genres. I just think you should uh, believe in what you love and, and, and trust the music you like and not play a specific style of music just because you think it falls within that category and be afraid, conversely be afraid to play something because you think it might fall outside your preordained or preconceived category. Here we are in Ibiza. Look at the view. I mean, I can gob on all you like, but what you see behind you says it all. Welcome to Ibiza. Well, we're here in Bar M. This is definitely one of my favourite haunts in Ibiza. We do the uh, Judgment Sundays free parties here in advance, heading over the road, Sweden. Uh, I just play a short set here, just kind of wetting the appetite and stuff. Uh, I've wet my own appetite. They give me plenty of drinks as well at the same time. So um, a little bit of uh, coverage from here, and then we go over to Eden and check out Judgment Sundays, the opening party. Tonight is the opening party of Judgment Sunday's 2006 Ibiza. I've been coming to Ibiza since I was probably um, about 18, although in typical fashion I don't actually remember a thing about my first visit. I know I DJed in fashion and that's just about the only memory I've got of the place. Anybody who can remember their first time didn't have a good enough time. I think if you want to be a DJ, the first thing you've got to be is patient. I mean, most of my DJ buddies, in fact, I know just about all the DJs, and we've talked about it, have that nothing's been overnight for them. Success comes in five or even ten years. Ultimately, you've got to do whatever you can to get your head above a, what's a very crowded power pit. There's a lot of there's a lot of wannabe DJs, and you've got to go that extra mile. But well, if I look a bit unkempt and kind of unshaven, basically I finished DJing at um, five o'clock this morning in Ibiza. It's now um, it's now five p.m. Twelve hours later, um, I managed to get about two hours sleep between six and eight. Then I had to get up and catch a flight to Stansted. Um, the only convenient uh, flight connection because I had to be here in time to do my show from the Colours Fest festival in Glasgow was to then be driven from Stansted to Heathrow. Uh, managed to catch about. 10 minutes of England playing uh, the football on the TV in the lounge at the airport and then came up here and during that time I've spent the whole duration of both flights editing tracks which I plan to play during my set uh, at the festival at Colours Fest today uh, and that's pretty, a, a pretty normal scenario really. I try never to use flights as downtime, you won't catch me sleeping, watching movies, none of that crap. It's all about trying to sort of answer emails and on a day of an important gig like this actually doing some edits of some tracks and listening to them in your headphones, familiarising yourself and then uh, making your own bespoke version that's, that's tight and ready to play and I'm up for it, we're going to go with them. Well we're en route to Colours Fest in Glasgow and the weather couldn't be more appropriate for a festival occasion. I'll do the first half an hour from the truck and then I go outside onto the stage. Um, obviously I prefer the stage bit but it's quite surreal and quite 
different being in an OB truck as compared to the, the regular shenanigans going on in, in, in the BBC studios. Well, I'm backstage in one of these BBC branded OB trucks, they're called. Uh, outside they look very uh, repainted. Inside, I, I think a uh, Soviet radio pre-perestroika would be more the appropriate description. <laughs> We are building up to tonight six hours of dance music live from this year's Colours Fest in Renfrew, Glasgow. I'll be here for the next two hours. You'll hear me live from the Radio on Outdoor stage and no doubt hear some of the Scottish loons in the process. <laughs> So up for it. Every DJ will tell you the same thing. I know for a fact I'm going to be banging old time. the only moment where in front of a crowd I feel, I wouldn't say nervous, but a bit of tension because there's so many more things to think about. Speaking on the mic, not swearing, kind of playing the right records that are kind of bearing in mind what the people at home are listening to at the same time as playing to a crowd. So certain places, certain locations in, in Britain where people are a little bit more reserved and a little bit colder, I mean they still go for it, and there are other places where they just don't give a shit, and, and that's what Scotland is all about. With the conveniently placed disco nap, uh, we're now going back for the second time to Colours Fest, uh, doing the closing set on the main stage, and uh, kind of me thinking a little bit about what to play, but ultimately you've really got to look at the crowd and uh, make your decisions there. So I don't normally get nervous because I, I really come from nowhere, and, and it's been a very, very slow path, uphill, occasionally downhill and up again. For me, it's, it is all about the dance floor. It's about you know playing the right records at the right moment. I think if, if, if anything did wear, wear off and, uh, and the buzz started to wane, it would be immediately obvious. It wouldn't be for me to say, well, maybe I'm not into this as much as I once was. The crowd would, would, would speak with their feet, but. You know, I, I just love it. Simple as that. <laughs> 